What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Hashtag Ask GSM here today, episode 486 for Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. I am Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well, having a great week so far. If you haven't already, please check out the episode from last week. Had an awesome time recording with Alexis back for the first time in a while. Uh, she was asking for it and it ended up going great. We got a lot of great feedback on it, so I appreciate you guys for that. But if you haven't already, please check out that episode. It's 90 minutes of awesome audio, a lot of great questions, a lot of great analysis, and hopefully... It's not too long. It's not another year or so before she's back on the show again. So keep an eye out for that. And again, check out the episode. I had a great time. Uh, but if you want to send that a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRam with the hashtag AskGSM. You can find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash gram.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section and this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. Speaking of which, I will be at California, in California, for WrestleMania week, all of next week, leaving on Monday, not coming back until the following Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, around that area. So I'll be gone for a while, uh, which means I will be gone for next week's hashtag SGSM. I'm trying not to miss that show, so continue sending in your questions. My current plan is still record it, is still to record it on Wednesday. I'm just not sure at what point. So maybe early on in the day on Wednesday before I head out uh, for the day, Maybe put it up before I leave, wake up extra early. I'm not sure yet, so keep an eye out for that. The episode should still be up on Wednesday. I'm just not exactly sure when, like I said, uh, but keep an eye out for that. It will be up at some point, and uh, yeah, it's the WrestleMania week episode. How can I miss it? But anyway, we get right into your questions for this week, starting with the YouTube questions. First one being, at Micah does it. And again, I'm all over the place here. I haven't put up the questions in a document yet. What else is new? But his first question was, uh, what is your favorite WWE theme song right now? And what is the worst WWE theme song in present day WWE? Worst theme song, honestly, I don't know my favorite. I have a number of favorites. There's a lot of great themes currently in WWE. Roman Reigns is probably my number one. Uh, the Tribal Chief song, that heel song that he's been using now for a couple of years is excellent. Uh, really gives you a big fight feel. And not just because the song itself is great, but also what it means. Like every time he comes out, not that there's this deep meaning to the song, but... You know, you know it's going to be a big fight feel every time you hear that song. People rise to their feet, throw up the ones. It, it's it's a big time. So it, it's, it's got that big time feel to it. So I got to go with Roman Reigns. I really like Rollins' theme. He's got a great theme. Um, Riddle's theme I like. You know, there's not a lot of themes I don't like. There's a lot of themes that are like, eh. Um, you know, there's a lot of great themes, though. I'm trying to think of another, like, really good theme. Rhea Ripley's song, honestly, is also excellent. Judgment Day's theme is awesome. Love Edge's theme song. So those are among my favorites currently. Again, least favorite, I don't really have an answer. There's a lot I just don't give a fuck about, like Shayna Baszler's song, I think is far inferior to the one that she was using previously by CFO, but it is what it is. Uh, Sami Zayn's current CFO song, I'm glad it's back. Probably not permanent, but I'm enjoying it while it lasts. Also one of my favorite songs as well. Uh, Central Man Network. Who should put The Rock into the Hall of Fame? Good question. The first name that comes to mind is Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, I don't know if Austin has ever inducted anyone. I know he was obviously inducted himself back in 2009. Uh, him inducting Vince at some point down the road, if Vince isn't dead by then, would also make sense. But beyond being inducted himself, I'm not sure if Steve has ever actually done the inducting for someone else. Maybe he has, and I'm forgetting. Um, but I feel like he would make the most sense. He's the person that was closest to The Rock in WWE as far as being his biggest rival. Uh, they were the two biggest stars of the Attitude Era. Like, I don't know if Vince would make sense. Um, maybe someone from his family, like the NOI family, maybe. But personally, I would probably just go with uh, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin if he was around to do it. I feel like that would make the most sense. Micah does it. Their next question. If Big E is not able to wrestle any longer in WWE, do you think you would be good at it as a commentator role uh, like Samoa Joe was for a bit and like Corey Graves is right now? I do think so. Big E is very well spoken. The guy is awesome. He really excels in any area that he's put into, whether it be talking, charisma, wrestling. Biggie's awesome. Um, would he be as good of a commentator as Corey Graves? I'm not sure because there's a fair amount of people that don't like Corey, but I still think Corey is great at being a commentator. He's a he's a natural for that role. Uh, Biggie is just naturally goofy, and not that he can't be goofy on commentary. I mean, he wouldn't obviously be goofy all the time. Not that he's, like, it's impossible for him to not be goofy, but I'm not sure if that would be a good 
you know, full-time role for him. Samoa Joe really excelled in the area as well. I feel like he would do a good job at it. I don't know if that, that would be a great full-time gig for him, but if they couldn't find another role, which I would find impossible because Big E's great again, you could really use him for anything, then that wouldn't be a bad idea. So I, I do think he's still going to come back at some point. I don't know that I don't know that for a fact. There is a chance he never wrestles again, you know, due to the nature of his injury. Um, but I would hope he will be back. He will be back at some point, I'm expecting, and hopefully it doesn't come down to the fact that he has to do commentary for the rest of his career. Uh, Micah does its next question. What are your top three favorite matches or moments at WrestleMania? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I did a whole list, and it's prob- it's a little outdated now because it was from seven years ago, but over on WrestleRant.com, my website, I did, I think, 30 or 32 favorite matches of mine in WrestleMania history. And every day leading up to WrestleMania 32 that year, I wrote about on the site, did a whole article, whole post on my favorite match in order, 1 through 30. It was a pretty extensive list. I did the same thing for SummerSlam that year as well. Again, it's outdated now because this was seven years ago. Um, But my favorite matches, I mean, Sean and Taker would have to be number one from WrestleMania 25. I, I remember when that happened, but I didn't even watch it live. I remember, and I've told this story before, that when the match happened, I didn't order the pay-per-view. It was actually grounded that year, so I couldn't go over to my friend's house to watch the show. So instead, I had to leave read the live chat on WWE Universe, which was like their version of Facebook at the time. And they had a live chat going of all the results and what was going on in the match, and like, oh, sweet chin music. And I was like watching the live chat, and I remember, oh, shit, Shawn Michaels kicked out of the tombstone, blah, 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 and it was crazy, so... Um, I loved it even then before even being able to watch it for the first time a couple of months later. So, uh, Taker and Sean, other favorite matches and moments? I mean, there's just so many. There's so many. Uh, Being there for Kofi Mania at 35 was great. Probably my number one, honestly, because I was there for it, would be the Hardy Boys return to WrestleMania 33. That was my first WrestleMania. I'd always wanted to see the Hardy Boys back in WWE. The way that it happened was perfect. The anticipation was great. The moment was amazing. Um, that will probably always be my number one, was that. Taker and Sean from from 25, like I said. Um, as far as another match, again, there's just so many that come to mind uh, that I've really, really liked. Like, I really liked uh, some of the more underrated WrestleMania matches, too. Like, Rock and Cena, I also really liked. From WrestleMania 28, believe it or not. Uh, like that match. Jericho and AJ Styles, even, from WrestleMania 32 was another one I, I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, there was another match I remember really, really digging. I don't remember it now. Let me go back on my website as we speak. I probably should have prepared for this, but, uh, like my favorite WrestleMania matches, period. My number one one was obviously Taker and Sean. My number two was Taker and Triple H from WrestleMania, um, from WrestleMania 30 or 28 as well, actually. Hmm. Taker and Sean part two. I have Sean and Kurt on my list here at number three, which would... Makes sense, because I really, really like that match. Uh, That probably would be my other favorite match for Mania. I mean, there's probably other ones that come to mind from the last couple of years. I'm trying to think. Ah, 37, 38. I mean, being there for the Stone Cold return, the Cody Rhodes return would also rank pretty high up there as far as favorite moments. Um, Those would probably rank pretty high up there. So, I mean, I would really have to think about it some more. There's just so many that come to mind. But my favorite match, I'll put it this way. My favorite match is Sean and Taker from 25. My favorite moment is the Hardy Boys coming back at 33. That's what I would say. Um, let's see. Next question here, also from... Ba, 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 ba. Billy, you asked a question about um, who I thought the most underrated WWE, WCW superstar of all time is and the most overrated. I can't answer that honestly just because there's such a wide array of answers, of potential answers there. And I can't even speak to everyone who is ever been underrated or overrated in the business in the last, you said ever, so um, I'm probably not the best person for that question. I could probably give you a couple of people that are underrated, overrated, were overrated, were underrated. I mean, I, I don't know. I, honestly, not a lot of names come to mind off the top of my head. There are a lot of answers, but I'm probably not the person to ask that question. But your Twitter question, though, I will answer this. You asked me, who would be your Mount Rushmores for impact on the business and then one for pure technical ability in the ring. So, again, this is also a pretty loaded question, but I can answer this a bit easier than the other one. Um, As far as the impact on the business Mount Rushmore, to me, and again, my answer might change after doing more thinking on it, but off the top of my head, I would say Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold Steve Austin, 
probably, I mean, you said the business. Like, I'm thinking WWE. So I'm not including, like, Anoki um, and other promote. I mean, you would have to put Vince McMahon on there, right? I mean, without Vince and WWE, I'm not sure where wrestling would be today. So um, you didn't say wrestlers on the impact of the business one. So I probably would say Vince, Stone Cold, Hulk Hogan, maybe Anoki. I mean, you could say Sam Martino as well, but I mean, I feel like Vince and Sam Martino kind of go hand in hand because Sam Martino was booked by Vince, as were Hogan and Steve. But I mean, Sam Martino was a big part of the success of WWE early on in that 70s, 80s period. Um, but I mean, Vince McMahon was really the one that was jump starting that whole era of WWE and whatnot. So I would probably say Vince, Stone Cold, Hogan, and then, I mean, you can say Cena, but. I mean, you said impact on the business. Cena had a pretty big impact. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm not really sure. You could put Cena in there. I would probably put someone that's outside of WWE, whether it be another promoter. Um, I mean, Ted Turner, maybe. I don't know. Fucking Anoki, like I said, for his impact elsewhere in other parts of the business in other countries and whatnot. There's a lot of different answers you could put on there for that fourth one, but I would probably, for at least three of them, say Stone Cold, Vince, and Hogan. For the pure technical ability one, I would probably say Bret Hart, Ric Flair. I mean, when you say technical, you're talking like best in the ring? Because I would probably say Flair, Bret, Sean. Flair, Bret, Sean, and then... I mean, I don't know. I would say Daniel Bryan, but I feel like that's such like a, a recent answer. It would have to be someone a bit... You know, um, long like that was around a lot longer in WWE than Daniel Bryan was. Hmm, I'm not really sure. Again, I have three there. I'm not sure who that fourth one would be. I mean, I guess you could say Randy Savage, but there, I'm sure there, I'm sure there were other people that were better in the ring than Randy Savage. Uh, Randy Savage was amazing, but it was like the charisma that really took him to that next level. I'm not sure if he would be on that Mount Rushmore again. It would probably be someone from another either era or another company that I'm not thinking of. I mean, you could go with someone more recent, like a Daniel Bryan, because he is one of the greatest of all time as well. Again, I have three. I don't. That fourth one is kind of an open-ended spot, but if Mount Rushmore was three people, it would include those three for sure. And there's probably other people I'm not thinking about as well. So now we go back to the beginning of the Twitter questions here. Uh, from at Iwagu91, first one being, do you think Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn versus the Usos should headline night one of WrestleMania? I do, and listen, I'm among those people that have Charlotte and Rhea headlines night one. I'm honestly not upset. Not because I feel like it should main event, but I understand why it would. The woman kind of got the women kind of got fucked last year in the sense that they were supposed to go on last. I'm glad they didn't because the Stone Cold return, the in-ring return was just so much better than Charlotte and Ronda, which wasn't an overly good match at all. I do think Charlotte and Rhea will have a better match than Charlotte and Ronda did last year. I do think the more anticipated match of the two is Kevin and Sammy versus the Usos. It has a better story. Ideally, both nights of WrestleMania should be headlined by the Royal Rumble winners. They've talked up for weeks now, oh, Rhea Ripley and Charlotte headlining main eventing WrestleMania, blah, blah, blah. And then it doesn't main event. I mean, at least last year, in storyline, they technically did main event up until Austin and Owens became an impromptu match. It wasn't like the advertised main event of WrestleMania. Charlotte and Ronda was. Um, Charlotte and Rhea, they are advertising, essentially, as the night one main event. I think it would be fine if it was the main event as long as Rhea wins and it's a good match. I do think the tag team title match would be better. If the tag team title match doesn't main event night one, then it's got to open night two. You bookend the show with the bloodline stuff, Reigns in the main event, Usos in the opener. Um, that would be amazing. I do still think it should main event because, again, it's going to be probably the better match and it definitely has the better story. You can't always go in the main event with like, oh, you have to have the two Rumble matches in the main event. I mean, not necessarily. If you have a match that's bigger than the championship for the men or the women, then you got to go with that. They should have done a better job of making Charlotte and Rhea feel more like a main event than the tag team title stuff, but the tag team title stuff has just got so much history, as do Charlotte and uh, Rhea. But, I mean, come on, this tag team title stuff has been furthered amazingly well every week now for, like, close to a year. So, in my opinion, if I'm booking, I do put the tag team title match on last. I feel like that's the biggest possible way to close that show. People are looking forward to it. It's had an amazing story. The payoff should be great with Kevin and Sammy finally winning the tag team titles after, 
years of not having held them in for uh, the Usos, having held them for now almost two years. I would honestly go with that as the main event, but I understand why it would be Charlotte and uh, Rhea, and I wouldn't be upset at that. If Charlotte and Rhea headlined, or Charlotte and Ronda, rather, headlined last year over the, <coughs> over the Steve Austin and Ring return, that I would have been upset over, just because that match, ultimately, in retrospect, was not very good. So I get why they put the Steve Austin stuff on last. But honestly, I do think... I, I would probably still say, even after we get Charlotte and Rhea, I'm sure it should be a very good match. I would still put the tag and title match on, stuff on last. But maybe they're doing this for a reason. Uh, maybe they can work it out well. And Like when the Rumble match, the Men's Rumble opening, the Rumble pay-per-view on paper, I was like, eh, I don't think that's a good idea. But in retrospect, it worked out as well as it could have, honestly, because the headline with the Sami Zayn turn at the end, so the fact it didn't headline made the most sense. So I think the way that it's going to work out, hopefully it will work out for the better, um, but it, I still do think it should be the tag team title match headlining that one, because that to me is the one of the biggest attractions of the entire weekend, aside from Roman and Cody, even maybe even more so, just because the story's been in the works now for so long. His second question, if Vince McMahon was still handling creative, would he be booking Solo Sokoa the same way he's being booked now? Um, maybe not as well, but I, I, I still don't think Solo would have, gotten, would have gotten called up and then been buried. I still think he probably would have been brought up as part of the bloodline. Um, I guess he could have gotten called up and feuded with them or not done anything with them. That just wouldn't have made any sense. I mean, that was always an option, but I feel like that would have been the worst option as far as like... You know why would he be up there and they're talking about the bloodline and they have their fucking relative on the other brand? That just doesn't make any sense. So he probably would have been beaten by now. Um, maybe he would have been more of a you know lackey and taking the pinfalls for the group more than he has. He hasn't been pinned at all yet. He's lost tag team matches, I believe, but he hasn't lost by pinfall whatsoever. I'm not even sure if he's lost the tag team match. That I'm not even sure about. Maybe I know he's lost matches by DQ, uh, but he hasn't been pinned or submitted yet. That could happen next week with Cody if he faces Cody on next week's show. And, um, yeah, I feel like he probably still would have been protected, though. Solo seems like a guy to me that Vince would have liked. But then again, there's been plenty of guys and girls over the last number of years that I thought Vince would have liked, and he fucking buried or misused anyway. So, who the fuck knows? Um, his next question, your thoughts on the SummerSlam logo for this year? I think it's really cool. Everyone's been talking about it. I think it's a sexy-ass logo for Detroit. I'm not overly enthused. I mean, apologies to all my you know, Detroit listeners here, anyone that lives in Michigan. Detroit has never really been a place on my list of, of places that I've wanted to visit. That doesn't sound like the most glamorous fa uh, most glamorous place to hold a SummerSlam, but I am looking forward to it. I've never been there before. Uh, assuming I do go, I'm not sure yet, but, you know, you never know. I'm just assuming I will because I was at SummerSlam the last two years. Um, but anyway, the logo, you know, looks great, and it perfectly matches the vibe of being in Detroit, like they did with SummerSlam last year. The SummerSlam logo for last year matched being in Nashville, and now they're matching it to um, being in Detroit, which I think is really cool. At Reborn Again, John Ritland from the Twitter machine and on YouTube, Real Honesty with John Ritland. Check it out, does great work. His first question was, so Cody tells Roman Reigns that he's sick of everyone bringing up Dusty, and he says the same Cody who brought up Dusty's name a lot of weeks on end. Uh, a lot of weeks, uh, a lot. He brought up his name a lot for weeks on end. Projecting much? John asks. Um, yes, it, it was a little weird when Cody mentioned that, um, you know, we, we, we talk too much about Dusty and all this other sort of stuff, and he's like, oh, if I hear Dusty's name one more time, it's going to make me vomit. It's like, weren't you the one that in a lot of circumstances was bringing him up in conversation and in promo? So I did think that was funny, but uh, at least they're moving the story away from the Dusty stuff and more on Cody and his journey and, and Roman being champion. I thought the exchange on Monday was phenomenal. That was amazing stuff. And I hope we get at least one more promo between the two, between now and WrestleMania, because that was really, really good. We probably won't, but it would be nice if we did. One last third final promo. But that was great, though. And, um, yeah, no, I just thought the fact that he brought up Dusty and was like, oh, I'm going to vomit, which, like you said, it, it sounds like projecting because uh, we've heard a lot of that sort of thing from Cody about, you know, about Dusty in the last couple of weeks. So for him to say that was a bit comical. Um, let's see here. His next question, what's a match or matches from a past WrestleMania or multiple WrestleManias that should have been higher on the card or even main evented and why? Uh, again, I, I've probably answered this before, but, you know, a match from past Manias that should have been higher or main evented. The fact that Batista and Taker was like fucking fourth on the card 
on WrestleMania 33 or 23 rather. And I wasn't a fan at the time. I wasn't watching wrestling back then. But like in retrospect, that was probably the best match on the show. Why it went on fourth, and I know they were pissed off about that. And that's, I mean, maybe, maybe honestly, if they went on later, they may not have had as good of a match, honestly, because they were motivated and they were pissed. They were going on so early. And, and Taker won the Royal Rumble that year, which was what didn't really make much sense. He won the Rumble and they didn't main event. I mean, that's a little weird. And they had the best match on the show. I know they wanted to go on last with Cena and Sean, but Sean didn't win the championship anyway. It really should have been Taker and Batista in the main event, but whatever. As far as other matches that, I mean, should have main evented, I've talked about this before, but um, in a WrestleMania 8 with Flair and Savage. Hogan and Sid Justice going on last was fucking dumb. The match sucked. Um, I, I wrote about this last week, I think. You know, 10 with Brett Nolan was an amazing match. I mean, I could see why they opened the show with it. They book into the show with Bret Hart moments, so that was cool. 11, uh, 12. I mean, 11, they went on last with the Lawrence Taylor shit, but... I mean, he was the celebrity that year, so that kind of made sense, I guess. They went over last over... It went on last over Sean and Diesel, which was whatever. Um, You know, 13, Bret and Steve was the best match on the show. Did not main event, but didn't have anything on the line, so I get that. 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, all made sense. I mean, you could say Taker and Sean from 25, but that wasn't ever going to main event. I mean, it was the best match on the show. It probably should have gone on... Second to last before the main event, uh, and after the World Heavyweight Championship match, which also wasn't overly memorable, the triple threat between Edge, John Cena, and Big Show. Um, you have that one. I'm trying to think. 33, didn't love the Roman and Taker main event. Uh, just was not a good match, but it went on last because they had to get that final visual of Taker descending into the stage, even though he didn't retire after that, which was fucking dumb. Um, WrestleMania 35, the women going on last did make sense, but, you know, Kofi and Brian was the better match that year. 34, I would have given the main event to Styles and Nakamura. Brock and Roman just sucked. I mean, Styles and Nakamura may not have had as good of a match anyway. It probably would have been the same thing. They did have a pretty good match, it just wasn't the instant classic people expected. I still probably would have gone on last with uh, Nakamura and Styles, though, personally. There was that. 33, I already mentioned. 32, eh. 31 was great, 30 was great, 29, eh. Uh, Taker and Punk that year probably should have gone on farther than it did. I'm pretty sure that was also like in the middle of the show, towards the beginning of the show. That should have gone on later, that was the best match in that th that entire show by a wide margin. So those are just a few as far as matches that should have gone on later, or just flat out main evented. Rockin', rockin', um, you know, Hogan being another one from WrestleMania 18... I mean, that was the real main event of that show, but were you really going to put that one on last, is the question, over Triple H and Jericho? Probably not with nothing on the line, but then again, they did close with Cena and Rock at WrestleMania 28, so, you know, that's another one I would say. WrestleMania 18, Rock and Hogan probably should have been on, probably should have been the main event, because that was the real attraction of that show over Triple H and Jericho, which was good, but far from the instant classic that Hogan and Rock was. Not even because of anything they did in the ring, but rather because of what they had going on. Um, you know, with just the, the dream match scenario and everything going on to the two at the time. Uh, next question from at noob underscore n underscore co TV. Their question was, your thoughts on Ty Valkyrie making her AEW debut last week. Do you think she'll beat Jade Cargill for the TBS title of Double or Nothing this year? Because I don't want Ty Valkyrie to get lost in the shuffle and compete on AEW Dark. I mean, that's exactly what I said last week. I'm very happy for Taya being an AEW because she's an excellent talent. She deserves to be on a main stage. I just don't want her to get lost in the shuffle. Um, her going back to WWE, I could see why she'd be hesitant with that because they used her so poorly last time. I mean, she didn't have a bad run, but she got cut before she could really get going. I mean, she was there for a couple of months. Didn't really do a whole lot, but that's because they didn't really... They didn't have her, like, debut in the ring until, like, fucking June, I think. Like, she wasn't really doing anything for a while, and then Vince took over NXT or whatever the fuck happened. NXT 2.0 happened, and that was it. Um, so I love Taya being on a bigger stage. She deserves it. I don't think she's taking the TBS title from, from Jade. They don't even have to wait for that match until Double or Nothing. They could do it on TV before then. And then if Chris Statlander is ready to come back for Double or Nothing, then you do that match there. If she's not ready... Then you have Taya do the match at Double or Nothing, which again is in two months, but maybe they can make more of a feud out of it, make it interesting, drag it out. Seems a little long to me, but we'll see if they can make it interesting. At least Jade finally has some competition, because she hasn't had competition for so long now. I mean, that's a positive, so I appreciate that. 
But, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I just don't want her to get lost in the shuffle. I said last week, I was saying to RJ, actually, if she doesn't lose, if she doesn't win the TBS title, then LOL. I don't think that's fair, though. I mean, I don't think she's going to beat Jade for the championship. I just want to make sure that after that feud is over, she has some sort of direction and she's not competing on fucking dark like Ruby Soho was for like a good year or so. And uh, Tony Storm as well. Like, give these women something to do. Interesting stories outside of the title picture. The whole outcast thing is improving. It's still not great, but it's okay. It's gotten better, I guess. Um, but yeah, hopefully Taya can find her footing in the company and doesn't get lost in the shuffle beyond uh, that TBS title feud ending at some point in the not-too-distant future. His second question. After what Cody said to Roman Reigns and Raw this week, are we looking back at the end of the bloodline as we know it? Jimmy and Jay turn on Roman Reigns, Solo Sokoa is going, uh, part, part in the pun, solo, and Roman loses his championships. If this isn't the end of the bloodline, which it doesn't necessarily have to be, it is the beginning of the end. I do think Roman will and should lose his championships at WrestleMania, far from a guarantee. There's a very good chance Roman retains. But I do think that, uh, you know, the end of the bloodline could be near. Now, they don't have to turn on Roman on that show, but they could still exist after Roman takes time off after Mania, which he absolutely should. That's the current rumor, thank God. Um, the Roman Reigns can take time off, and then, like, the Usos can either lead the group, co-lead the group, whatever, and then Roman comes back, sees that they've either done better without him, or they're just, you know... They've shown that they don't need a leader in Roman anymore, and he gets pissed and beats the shit out of Jay or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of different directions you can go. Roman can come back as a babyface for all we know. I wouldn't do that necessarily, um, at least not right now, but that's also an option. So anyway, um, yeah, I think we are looking at the beginning of the end, the beginning of the end for the bloodline. It probably won't end at WrestleMania. I wouldn't even necessarily end it at WrestleMania because there's more stories you can tell with the group just with Roman Reigns not as champion. But uh, we will soon see. I know they're really teasing it right now, which might mean that it's not happening, which would be a bummer, at least to me. I wouldn't do that necessarily. Um, but yeah, I think if it, if I'm booking, if it's up to me, then I would have this be the first major nail in the coffin of the bloodline as we head towards the next chapter of the group. At RG underscore Marceau, Mr. Marceau's question was, for the women on the main roster who haven't won either show's women's championship, who do you think has the best star potential? I've been singing Tegan Knox's praises for a long time now, but she hasn't done anything since coming back, really. Uh, she's lost a tag team title opportunity, and that was about it. So, I think Tegan has a lot of potential if they actually got behind her and pushed her. Um, beyond her, Raquel Rodriguez probably has the biggest star potential. That might sound odd, because some people aren't sold on her, and that's fine. I think she's very good. I think she can be a better heel. She's already done well our first year in the company. She's gotten a number of title shots, tag team title shots. She won the tag team titles. She's challenged multiple times for the SmackDown Women's Championship, had some good matches with um, Ronda Rousey over that title, had a good showing in the Royal Rumble, Elimination Chamber. So Raquel, I think, has a lot of star potential, and hopefully they can kind of get going with her after WrestleMania. Raquel Rodriguez is one. Tegan, if they actually got behind her, then she's another. On Raw... Piper Niven I like a lot. There's a lot of women on Raw, I think, that are very talented, but you're saying best star potential. Probably not Mia Yim, who I like a lot. Same thing with Candice. Maybe Piper, potentially. Uh, let's look at the women's division here for Raw, because there's a few different people that could make sense. Now that, you know, Bianca's champion. You said that haven't held the women's championship so far. So looking at the Raw women's division, Alexa Bliss already has, Asuka has, Bailey has, Becky has, Bianca has. Uh, there's Candice, Carmella has, and I wouldn't count Carmella anyway. Probably, honestly, looking at the roster here, Io Sky. Absolutely Io Sky. Io Sky has not obviously been a Raw or a SmackDown Women's Champion yet, just WWE Women's Tag Team Champion. Um, Io Sky is awesome. Hopefully they can really start getting going with her at some point, break up damage control, or just build around her even. Uh, Io Sky, to me, has the most star potential, but they got to get going with her, with her soon. She's been around for a while, and... You don't want to establish her as just an enhancement undercard talent in damage control. She has to be a standout at some point. And I think she can really shine if given that opportunity. Um, at Prince of S2, their question was, with fans showing the Bloodline storyline with... showering the Bloodline story uh, storyline with praise is one of the greatest stories in WWE history. What do you think from beginning to end are the top five best stories slash storylines in company history? The timing of this question is great. I will defer this question 
to add Solomonster on Twitter, obviously does his show. I'm a big I'm a big fan of Jason's. Uh, Solomonster sounds off. He literally just did a segment on his show this past week, his 800th show, talking about the top 10, actually, not even five, top 10 best storylines in WWE history. And all of my answers would be everything that he mentioned. So I can't even really claim these answers as my own, but go out and listen to that part of his show. I think he put the excerpt on his YouTube channel. He did list, spoiler alert, Vince and Steve Austin as number one. That has got to be the best story this company's ever told. The Bloodline storyline isn't over yet. I would still put that in the conversation. Um, you know, Savage and Elizabeth being one of them. Hogan and Savage being another from the Mega Powers back in the 80s. Those would all be up there. Brett and Owen, their story of a few years in the, er, in the early 90s. Daniel Bryan versus The Authority, even though they kind of fell backwards into that one. They were kind of forced into that one, but it was still one of the best stories this company's ever told. Um, yeah, any, any of those, honestly, would probably be the best stories WWE's ever done, ever. Um, there's probably more I'm not thinking of, but definitely those. Let's see, and final couple of questions here from at E13A. How do you feel about the Fatal 4-Way Tag Team Showcase matches at WrestleMania? Uh, I really just don't care. Like, it's nice that they're getting more talent on the show, don't get me wrong, but we're at a point where it's like, these matches mean nothing, there's no stakes... Who could possibly give a shit? Um, they said there would be qualifying matches, even though they just announced the men's match on Monday without any qualifying matches at all. It, who cares? I mean, that shit belongs in the pre-show. They probably won't put it on the pre-show. They haven't done a pre-show match in years. Uh, they'll probably just put it on the main show. Cool. It's a bath. It honestly is the bathroom break of WrestleMania. I'm glad they're getting on the show and those people are getting a paycheck, but the matches mean nothing. And they should only put shit on the show that actually means something. I honestly would be more okay with the Battle Royal. People like Battle Royals. Not to say these matches will be bad. They should be very fun. But there's no stakes, at least with the Battle Royal, you're winning a fucking trophy, which is also meaningless. But I don't know. I, I think a Battle Royal is that you can get more people in a Battle Royal. People like Battle Royals. Every single Battle Royal is the same. But I don't know. These showcase matches, what do they even fucking mean? They mean nothing. His next question, um, do you think all championships will change hands at WrestleMania? No, all titles but the United States Championship. I think John Cena beating Theory for the title would be fucking dumb. I won't even go on a major tangent about that right now because I've done it before, I won't do it again. That would be very stupid. If, if Theory were to lose to Cena and lose that championship, people saying, oh, but he could lose it the next night to Jay White. Then what the fuck does that do for Theory? I know you don't give a shit about Theory, that's fine, but they've invested so much in him at this point, why would you just turn around and bury the guy? That would make no sense at all. So, no, I don't think Theory will lose. I think they'd be beyond fucking dumb if you lost. Um, I think Theory retains, but everyone else, I do see Rhea beating Charlotte. I do see Asuka beating Belair. I could see Bianca maybe beating Asuka, but then, again, like, what do you do from there? Like, I don't know. Asuka, I think, will win the championship. I think Rhea will win her championship. I think the Usos and Zayn, I'm sorry, Zayn and uh, Owens will beat the Usos for the tag team titles. And I do think Cody will beat Roman. And I also think that... Uh, Gunther will drop the championship. I'm hoping the Sheamus. That's why he's in that match, hopefully, and not just... I mean, they could have very easily done... They very easily could have done Gunther and Drew, but they didn't. They threw in Sheamus for a reason, so I'm hoping Sheamus wins. Uh, maybe they threw in Sheamus to take the pinfall loss. That's also possible, but I really want Sheamus to win that championship. So, uh, no, I think all championships will change hands, but the United States title. And his last question here, do you think... Um, both night of this year's WrestleMania could be the best ever. No, I don't think it's going to be the best ever. Um, you know, I think it will end up being a good show. It's it's so hard to say oh, what's the best ever, what's the worst ever. I mean, I don't think anything for a lot of people will ever top WrestleMania 17. And it's also hard to judge what will be the best ever WrestleMania until it happens. I don't know. I wasn't watching wrestling back then. I can't imagine many people were saying going into WrestleMania 17, oh, this is going to be the best WrestleMania ever. I mean, it's all about the execution. You can have a great build, but a bad WrestleMania, or a bad build and a great WrestleMania. That's happened the last couple of years. WrestleMania 38's build wasn't overly great, but the show itself was amazing. Honestly, it was one of the best manias in the last seven, six to seven years, at least. So, I don't know. Um, I would definitely say uh, it will be a good show. Best ever? I don't know. Let's not go that far. I don't want to set expectations too high, and then the show underwhelms, but... Um, I do think it will be one of the better shows in recent years, and we've had some pretty good manias in recent years. Um, based on what we've had on, you know, what looks to be a great show on paper, Triple H booking gives me some faith here. And, um, yeah, we'll see what happens in the next uh, couple of weeks, and if they can book that show to be as 
good as it possibly can be, or if it falls flat and it ends up just being a bad or a forgettable WrestleMania, because we've had plenty of those as well, trust me. And that's going to do it, guys, for episode 486 here today of Hashtag Ask GSM. I'm here for March 22nd, 2023. almost forgot the date. Thank you guys, as always, for sending in questions to the show. I appreciate it. Uh, like I said, we will be back next week. I'm just not sure when. I'm hoping to record the show on Wednesday morning. Um, I'll be out for most of the day on Wednesday, so I'm hoping to record it. I mean, I'll be getting, like, no sleep, but I'm hoping to wake up early on Wednesday, early, early, record the show, have it up either then or soon after or whatever. Um, so still send in your questions because I don't want to record it on Sunday because then it's like, what if something happens on, it's WrestleMania week. I don't, I don't want to record it that early in advance. So I'll probably record it that day, if not on Tuesday night. So still send in the questions on Tuesday at WrestleRant on Twitter with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash Graham the GSM. Matthews. Drop a comment on the post. I usually put up on Tuesday nights. Forgot last night. I apologize, but I usually do. If not in the wall itself, if the post isn't up. And be sure to drop a comment down below in the very video down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. Have an awesome one, guys. Enjoy the rest of WrestleMania season. I'm Graham GSM Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.